All right, so in the last lecture, we were talking about the 1990s and particularly the cultural side of the 1990s and more or less how that decade left us with a lot of really important unanswered questions that uh, would be answered um, and maybe addressed is a better way of putting it in the 21st century. Um, that being said, 2000 is going to be a presidential election year, and it's a presidential election in which Bill Clinton, the incumbent, is not going to be running because he's served two back-to-back -back terms. So we're going to have a new president, and it's a wide-open sort of field, so to speak. The two front runners for both the Democrats and the Republicans, let's begin with George W. Bush. Now, you should know a little bit about George W. Bush, considered I've told you quite a bit about his father, uh, George H. W. Bush, that was elected in 1988 and defeated by Bill Clinton in 1992. So, George Bush, as you might imagine, is quite well connected politically. His father was president. Before he was president, he was vice president. Before he was vice president, he was a uh, director of the CIA. He was, uh, you know, very, very well connected politically. Uh, George H.W. Uh, Bush's father, Prescott Bush, was a senator from uh, Connecticut. So th these are very well-established people in the realm of politics. They're also very well-established financially. Uh, George W. Bush went to Yale. Um, he uh, really kind of made himself out to be a, uh, a true blue Texan, a uh, UT, Texas Tech sort of individual, but uh, he was educated at Yale, and after Yale, he went on and got an MBA from Harvard University, so he's an Ivy Leaguer, okay? Now, on a personal level, George W. Bush is um, a little bit of a wanderer. Uh, I mean, he even went so far as to say that in uh, his early his early adulthood years, uh, he he he, he kind of wandered aimlessly, and if the truth be known, had um, dabbled into some things that uh, probably weren't the best things for him to do. Uh, I'm talking about uh, primarily things like alcohol. But in any case, uh, really cleans himself up toward uh, the end of all of this and establishes himself as a power to be reckoned with in the world of politics. Um, first as a uh, Texas House level and ultimately the governor of Texas. Now, one individual that saw an awful lot of potential in George Bush was a guy by the name of Karl Rove, a brilliant strategist, um, a conservative strategist, that really leveled with Bush that there is an awful lot to like about him, but he doesn't have an, a whole lot of experience. And so one of the things that Rove really conveyed to George Bush is that you need to be on point with your messaging. You need to be this guy all the time. And that may, for the time being, help uh, close the gap between your competition and you when it comes to experience. Okay. Now, the guy that's running against George Bush is a guy from Tennessee by the name of Al Gore. And again, you, you may know a thing or two about Al Gore, uh, films like An Inconvenient Truth and a lot of his work in environmentalism has become synonymous with his name in our day and age. In any case, Gore had been serving for the last eight years as Bill Clinton's vice president. And you would think that in those eight years of peace and prosperity, there was an awful lot to like about Al Gore and there was an awful lot to really kind of connect with Bill Clinton. I mean, certainly George H.W. Bush does this with Reagan in 1988. But we're just coming off of the Monica Lewinsky scandal, and Gore tries to put as much room between him and Bill Clinton as humanly possible. Now, the other thing that's not doing Al Gore any favors is the running of a third-party candidate, a guy uh, that runs on the Green Party that year by the name of Ralph Nader. Um, now, if you had to place Nader in the political realm, you, you would call him somewhere to the distant left, meaning he's even more liberal than Al Gore uh, in the election of 2000. And so, very similar to 1992, when Ross Perot siphoned off all those votes, those conservative votes from George H.W. Bush, same thing's going to happen to the Democrats in 2000, whereas Ralph Nader is going to win a lot of votes the, from people that probably would have voted for Gore had Nader not been in the race. In any case, what I want you to write down next to George Bush's name is the idea that he's a compassionate conservative. 
right? That's what he's running on in 2000, the idea that he really is a conservative. He believes in small government, lower taxes, things of that sort, but he does have compassion. He understands that there are specific government programs that really do make a meaningful difference in people's lives, and you can't just slash and burn all of them, okay? So anyway, uh, the election of 2000 is going to go down as one of the most, uh, the closest elections in American history, and it is. It's, it was neck and neck all night long. As a matter of fact, by the time that the night ended, we still didn't know who won the presidency, okay? One thing that I'd like you to understand here is that George Bush is going to go ahead and lose the popular vote, meaning coast to coast, more people are going to vote for Al Gore than voted for George W. Bush. But that's not how we elect presidents, at least not right now anyway. Okay, We elect presidents in the Electoral College, and ultimately it comes to be known that if George Bush can win Florida, he's going to win the election, even though he would have lost the number of votes uh, in, in, in total. Okay. Now, I remember very specifically when Florida was called, very early on in the night, in November 2000, it was called for Al Gore. And I thought to myself at the time, this is really bad news for George Bush, considering, number one, Florida is critically, critically important, and number two, his brother, Jeb Bush, is the guy that is the governor of Florida. So you can't even deliver in a state that your, your brother is the own governor. That, that's really bad news, okay? In any case, the night went on and on and on, and uh, I remember that night, I had a lot of errands to do, and I came back home, and Florida had changed from blue to red. Um, there were a lot of people that said that the election in Florida was called too soon, and not all the votes were in, and in any case, uh, specific news outlets were calling it for Bush, and so Florida essentially switches colors. And by the end of the night, the, it's not even red any longer, it's yellow, and nobody knows what's happening in Florida. Now, any time that you're talking about an election that's this close, right, you're going to have to have a recount. In Florida, you know, it is absolutely neck and neck. Only several hundred votes are separating these two men, and that's, that is insanely, insanely tight, okay? So there's a recount underway, which sounds a lot easier to implement than what it is. Uh, there's a lot of people in Florida uh, that are retirees. Uh, they're older people. And a lot of their ballots weren't filled out properly. Uh, this is back in a day and age when you actually use like a pin pusher to plunge the hole next to uh, the guy that you wanted to vote for for president. And a lot of these people couldn't see that well, had arthritis in their hands. And, you know, long story short, they completed what political scientists call a hanging chad, an incompletely filled ballot. Anyway. Um, there's a lot of discrepancy, there's a lot of controversy within this recount, and then all of a sudden, um, the Supreme Court weighs in on this recount, and in a 5-4 to four decision, rules a decision entitled Bush v. Gore. Now, this is incredibly, incredibly important, because what Bush v. Gore does is it stops the recount, okay? I'm not going to get into the specific reasons as to why the Supreme Court wanted the recount to be stopped, but what I do need you to know here is that it said this should not be seen as precedent setting, right? Think back to 1954 with the Brown versus Board of Education decision, right? What that did was establish the precedent that when it comes to public schooling, you cannot say separate but equal. Separate but equal has no place, so you can't segregate the way that we had been up to that point. In any case, what the court is saying in this time, right, is that you should not look to this particular decision as something that, you know, should be seen as precedent. In other words, it's a one-time sort of deal. Anyway, it says the recount needs to stop immediately, and whoever is ahead at this particular moment, which happened to be George Bush, would win Florida and consequently the election. And so what I want you to understand is, going into his first term as president, George Bush was a very controversial president. Not only did he lose the popular vote, which is never really a strong way of beginning your presidency, but there are a lot of people that believed it was the Supreme Court that elected him and not the American people. Okay? Anyway, once Bush was inaugurated, he really moved away from this idea of being a compassionate conservatism, or excuse me, compassionate conservative. One of the primary reasons for that is that Bush surrounded himself from holdovers from the Reagan and George H.W. Bush presidencies. Individuals like Dick Cheney, who is going to become the vice president, who was the secretary of defense under H.W. Bush. Okay? 
Now Cheney and people like him are neoconservatives, and uh, they had a much different view of the world, in particular things like uh, the role that the United States ought to be playing in the international community. We had, after all, according to people like Cheney, won the Cold War, and you know we should, if we feel that one direction is best for us and consequently the rest of the world, we ought to have the discretionary uh, ability to pursue those aims, right? Now, the other thing that I need you to understand here is that the Democrats haven't gone away. They still are forced to be reckoned with in Congress until the 2002 midterm elections, okay? Now, what we're going to see is a guy by the name of Tom DeLay, uh, a congressman from Texas, that is going to launch what he calls the K Street Project. Now, on K Street in Washington, what you're going to see is uh, the street dotted with lobbyist firms. For those of you that don't know what a lobbyist does, uh, a lobbyist will try to influence politicians when it comes to one policy or another, and in a lot of cases they will make sizable donations to election funds and things of that sort. In, in any rate, what I need you to understand here is that Tom DeLay is winning a lot of influence on K Street, which he's then using to what he calls wage all-out war on the Democrats. And the net net of this situation is that the Republicans are not only going to take the House of Representatives in 2002, they're also going to take the Senate. So if you're keeping score, Bush has the presidency, he's a Republican, and both the, Cong both the House of Representatives and the Senate belong to the Republicans. This is a unique opportunity for Bush to really get some things done here. Okay, Talking about his agenda. One of the things that I need you to understand here is that um, when, when, when Clinton left office, um, he, he left office with a uh, you know, really large surplus, meaning we're bringing in more money than we're spending, but he also left with a little bit of an economic downturn, and this isn't anything really, really serious, but the tech bubble that had really driven the economy through much of the 1990s, it kind of burst and it went away, and the economy suffered as a result for it. Now, we've seen different political parties approach um, economic crises differently. We see uh, Franklin Roosevelt in the 1930s implement the New Deal, a stimulus process that uh, is designed to ramp up demand. And then in the 1980s, you see Ronald Reagan try to ramp up supply by cutting taxes. Well, George Bush, a conservative and a Republican, said when you have an economic recession, you need to put more hand, more money in more people's hands. And that's exactly what he begins to do. He begins to cut taxes. And when I say cut taxes, I mean he cuts taxes across the board. I mean, even me, who would have been all of 21, even I qualified for a tax cut back in those, those days. In any case, they might have seemed egalitarian, very equal on paper, but it was really the very wealthy and the corporations that really benefited from Bush's tax cuts. Okay, And so Bush is going to enter office with a $5.6 trillion surplus, and that surplus, the amount of money that we're taking in, that, that is discretionary money, that money is going to be gone within a year of his presidency. As a matter of fact, we're going to be right back into the deficits. Right, We're not taking in enough money. Uh, only about a year into the Bush presidency. So this is controversial. Make no mistake about this. This is very controversial in the sense that, you know, there's a lot of people that thought that this is quite a radical move for a guy that didn't even win the popular vote. Bush proceeded on. The other thing that's important to know about Bush's uh, agenda is something called faith-based politics. Now, for your notes, this is exactly what it sounds like. This is the integration of religious-based institutions, things like Alcoholics Anonymous, which is a very good program, but ultimately a religious program, um, receiving federal funding for it. Okay, Bush is going to not only fund some of these institutions that are overtly religious, He's also going to move away from things like family, family planning, abortion protection, um, and, and make no mistake about it, George Bush let it be known that he was an evangelical Christian, that he prayed openly, much like Ronald Reagan, uh, that he used his faith to, to guide his day-to-day -day decisions, and, and that included his political decisions. Okay, 
And so increasingly what you're beginning to see with this faith-based politics is the intermixing role of church and state. And there's a lot of people that once again say that's pretty controversial for a guy that would not be president had the, well, theoretically anyway, could, would not have been president had the Supreme Court just moved one vote another way, okay? So what I want you to understand here is George Bush is a pretty controversial president before the early days of September 2001. Now, what happens is September 11th changes everything. It, 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 cha it literally changed world history, not just American history, but world history, okay? It certainly changed the Bush presidency. It changed him into a wartime president, all right? In the early morning of September 11, 2001, um, two commercial airliners, uh, large jet airliners, um, crashed into the World Trade Center towers in New York City. Another one hit the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., and yet another one uh, went down in um, southern Pennsylvania, and we believe that that plane was headed for the White House. Now, this might come as no shock or surprise to you from the vantage point of the you know, 21st century, but as somebody that lived through this, you know, th th this this was as shocking as it must have been on uh, December 7th, 1941, when the Japanese hit us at Pearl Harbor. This is an attack on American soil, and it's multiple attacks. I mean, there's confusion, there's dismay, there's disillusion. Who, who could do this and why, right? Well, over the course of time, we come to the realization that the, these are no accidents, that these are coordinated attempts on the country, and it is ultimately the work of Osama bin Laden and his terrorist network of Al-Qaeda, okay? Now, ultimately, what we have happened here is bin Laden's henchmen uh, were sent to school, um, flight school, in the United States, where they learned to fly jet airliners, and then in September 2001, they hijacked these four planes and used them as weapons of mass destruction. It's quite a brilliant strategy if you stop to think about it, but ultimately what this does is it plunges the United States into what Bush is going to call the first war of the 21st century. I remember where I was that night. I remember what George Bush said to the American people when he finally addressed uh, um, uh, uh, his fellow Americans um, that evening. Right there, there's nothing that's being said throughout much of the day uh, from the from, from the White House anyway. Anyway, that evening, Bush went ahead and said that we were now immersed in the first war of the 21st century, and he essentially declared war on terror. Now, I remember thinking to myself that this war on terror was going to be very similar to the war on drugs in the sense that it was a metaphor. He was being metaphorical. We're going to pass policies. We're going to reevaluate policies that are designed to really curb the appeal of radicalism, radical Islam in, per in, in particular. Okay, But as it turns out, Bush was not being metaphorical at all. We were really going to wage war on terror. Now, how does one wage war on terror, considering there's, to my knowledge anyway, not a country anywhere, Middle East or otherwise, that is named terror, the Republic of Terror? What he really meant was we're, we're really going to hold the countries to task that harbor and assist uh, terrorism. And it comes to be known very quickly that this is not only the work of bin Laden, but bin Laden has been taking refuge for years in Afghanistan. And so the first war of the 21st century is essentially going to be waged on Afghanistan when Afghanistan refused to turn over bin Laden to the United States so that he could be prosecuted as a war criminal. In any case, as Bush's presidency, and I'm talking about his first term as president, as this presidency is going to unfold, what you're going to see are more wars, um, specifically in 2003 and beyond, more wars that are going to be waged in the name of a, a war on terror. Okay, And that's primarily what we'll pick it up the next time. We're going to talk about uh, not only Bush's foreign policy, but how this spills over into domestic policies.